um, yeah, yeah, of course. Go ahead, please. Yes. Okay. Okay. Welcome, everybody. It is my pleasure to be the chairperson for this session of the uh, webinar uh, on uh, differential geometry, America, Latin, uh, South American uh, uh, webinar on differential geometry. And today's speaker is Lucas Ambrosio. Uh, probably many of you already know his name or his papers. Uh, Lucas um, has uh, obtained his uh, bachelor's degree from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And then he's for his PhD, or a master's and PhD, he uh, moved to IMPA, which is also an institution in Rio de Janeiro. If I have read uh, well your uh, CV, Lucas had uh, the first advisor was Marcus Deitsche, is that correct? In uh, for the master's degree? For the master's degree, yes. Yeah, which is quite an accomplishment for who knows no. Marcus. Well, <laughs> I didn't avoid that dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the advisor was uh, Fernando Coda for the PhD, and now, of course, is. He's one of the most, uh, uh, we say, uh, respected uh, uh, geometers in, in Brazil. And uh, after this, Lucas um, uh, spent some time in England at the Imperial College in London. And eventually he was hired back in uh, IMPA a couple of years ago, if I'm not wrong. And uh, oh, he has several specialities in differential geometry, and uh, so I'm really eager to um, to learn about his recent uh, results that he will talk to about. Uh, he will talk to us um, today. So the title of his talk is uh, "Zoll-like Metrics in Minimal Surface Theory." So, Lucas, uh, your words usually the talks last about 50 minutes, but okay, you're flexible. Okay, okay, thank you very much, Paulo, for the introduction. So, I'm very happy actually to, to give this talk. Uh, actually, I gave a talk before at this uh, webinar in 2020. I was still in England. So, it was actually uh, very good to, to give that talk at that time when I was quite uh, isolated there in England. But anyway, so. As Paulo said, the title of the talk is so like metrics in mineral surface theory. So first of all, I need, I need to tell you what are so uh, metrics. So, uh, and by the way, I, I will change the, um, now I'm looking at my slides and I cannot see the, the, the screen. So if you have questions, you can okay. shout somehow and I will try to rest. Okay. So, Right, so let me put it full screen. Um, right. So, uh, one of the first things that we teach our students in differential geometry courses is how to compute the, well, we teach them what are geodesics and how to compute the geodesics of the Euclidean sphere. And of course, the Euclidean sphere, the geodesics of the Euclidean spheres are the great circles, the intersections of the sphere with the planes that go uh, to the center of the sphere. In particular, this means that uh, if you pick any point of the sphere and, and any unit vector, then the geodesic that you shoot from that point in that direction uh, will uh, get back to the same point uh, with the same speed, forming a periodic geodesic whose length is equal to 2 pi times the radius of the sphere. Okay? And this you can do on every point and on every direction. Right, so in the beginning of the 1900s, um, a student of David Hilbert called Otto Tso uh, made a surprising discovery at the time, I think. So he managed to write down explicit, explicit formulas for a sphere of revolution in R3 uh, that have a very special property. So just like the Euclidean sphere, all of their unit speed geodesics are periodic and they all have the same period. Okay? So, this came as a surprise. So, maybe you could think, ah, this property of the geodesic flow perhaps characterizes the 
ground sphere. And what Otto so showed is that no, uh, you cannot characterize this sphere. There are a lot many more other spheres with the same property. Okay, so you can abstract this into a general notion. We can call a Riemannian metric on a compact manifold a soul metric when all of its unique speed geodesics are periodic and have the same field. Uh, the fundamental examples, so they exist in all dimensions. You have the Euclidean spheres, of course, but also the projected spaces with the canonical matrix as symmetric spaces. Okay. And uh, during the last century, uh, this topic attracted the attention of many people. So there is a very interesting book by, by Bessie about manifolds, all of whose geodesics are closed. But I would say that the theory is still quite incomplete. Okay, so for example, uh, we don't have uh, yet a good understanding of what is the model space of its own matrix on the two C. Okay. Uh, so there are other examples by two. There are other examples that I will mention later, but we don't know, for example, if this space is connected or not. Okay. So still, there is a lot to be investigated about so many. Okay, but I mean, I mean, you can take this as an interesting geometric object and study it because of the nice geometric property it has. However, um, I think two methods are even more interesting, and they are even more interesting because they appear in different geometric problems in a quite surprising way. So I will explain you what is this problem. This is a problem about uh, systems of Riemannian two spheres. So what is the system of Riemannian two spheres? So on any Riemannian two sphere, uh, you can find at least one non-trivial periodic geodesic. So this is a theorem that goes back to Poincaré and Biko. And since you know there are no trivial periodic geodesics, it makes sense to define this number for every Riemannian metric on S2, the infimum of the length of non-trivial periodic geodesics. Okay? So it turns out, okay, so this number turns out to be a positive number, and you can take it as a geometric invariance. So in order to study it, it, you, you should try to compare it to other geometric events like curvature or like volume, like diameter. I mean, uh, any comparison that you can think of. And one of the most interesting comparisons, in my opinion, is the comparison between the system and the area. And this is because of this theorem of Croc. So Croc showed that for every Riemannian metric that you put on the sphere, the two dimensional sphere, with area, say, one, there is an upper bound that's uniform on all these metrics for the system of this uh, metric. Okay, so in other words, if you uh, keep the area fixed, you cannot make the system arbitrarily large. Okay, and this is uh, perhaps intuitive to, to see happening in the case of the family of ellipsoids. So if you take the sphere and the elongated ellipsoid, so if you keep this. Uh, um, cross-section uh, the same, and you just deform one of the axes, you get an ellipsoid that, have, uh, that has uh, a big area, but the system bounded uniformly by the length of this guy here, which is a geodesic. Okay? So this quotient that I wrote there can be made arbitrarily small. But if you try to increase the system compared to the area, so you, you go in the opposite direction, then you reach the sphere, and then when you deform a little bit inside, this guy here is not a good estimator for the system anymore, because this guy here, this uh, geodesic on the other axis, will have less length, and this will make the system uh, become a, a smaller number. Okay? And so what Krog uh, proves that this particular phenomenon that you can observe on the ellipsoids is actually a completely general phenomenon. Okay, and he conjectured uh, something about what is the sharp uh, estimate. Okay, and the sharp estimate should be this number square root of two times the square root of three. And so let me make some comments about this conjecture. So uh, we are still far to prove it. So the best of the bound 
to my knowledge, is due to Regina Rotland, which is about, I don't know, four times the number that you need. Uh, that was projected by Calabria group. Uh, also, this number here, this strange number, is the number that is asymptotically attained by a sequence of the matrix on S2 with positive curvature, and which this family of matrix uh, is converted to a shape that is, uh, you have to think of uh, two pieces of equilateral triangle. So you, you take two pieces of equilateral triangle, you glue one on the top of the other, so to form a topological sphere, right? So you are gluing two, two disks, so you are forming a sphere. And you put the metric here, which is a singular metric, uh, which is flat everywhere, except at the three vertices on which you see a conical singularity. Okay, so if you compute the system of a sequence of convex shapes converted to, 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 to this guy, you see uh, this quotient here, C to the value by square root of area, converting to this number, square root of 2 times the square root of 3. And this number is interesting because this number is strictly bigger than the square root of pi, which is the number that you get when you compute the C to the value by the square root of the area for the canonical method. Okay? So this is a maximization problem in geometry where the maximizing shape is definitely not uh, the round of perfect sphere. Okay, so these are different shape. Well, uh, this is the uh, this is the nature of the problem. Okay, so the maximizing shape will not be the round sphere. Lucas, the yes. Dub, a double flat disk. Okay. Would have smaller uh, smaller system. Then the then square root of two times square root of three. Yeah, I I think so because in this case, what is it? So the area of the disk is pi. So we have two this two pi. And the system, I would guess, would be twice the diameter. I was wondering why a triangle. Ah, why a triangle? Well, no. Yeah, well. So yeah, I'm see. sure if you do the computation, you get a smaller number. I see, I see. But so the conjecture is that the the, uh, the the double flat uh, triangle is the is the best one. This is the strong version of the the conjecture. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry. But, I mean, the project was only about the supremum, but sure, yeah. They observed that this shape seems to be the maximizer, but I don't think they claim that it's the unique maximizing shape. Thank you. Okay, so and the, okay, so this is the problem compare system to area, and where are the zone metrics in this story? Well, first of all, Weinstein showed that uh, every zone metric on S two has the same cease to normalize by the area as the canonical metric. Okay? So, for every zone metric, and we saw there are many of them, the C to the value of the square root of area is always equal to this number square root of one. Okay? So, the metric seems to be special. Uh, but more recently, Abondant, Brown, Rinefs, and Salomon, using symplectic geometry techniques, so which is very interesting, they show that so metrics are actually local maxima of the system normalized by the area. So if J Z is a zone metric on the two sphere, then there exists some C3 neighborhood of this metric such that on this neighborhood, the system of every metric on this neighborhood is at most square root of pi times the square root of the area. And this inequality is sharp because actually it holds, the equality holds if and only if this metric in this neighborhood is itself at so many. Okay? So this is uh, a quite remarkable result, I think. Um, and also, I can mention that among those metrics originally considered by so, namely those that are uh, rotational uh, spheres in R3, then square root of pi is actually the absolute maximum, attained also only by those spheres of revolution. Okay, so those two results of um, this group of people uh, kind of suggest a tantalizing question. So, 
maybe the smooth local maxima of the system divided by square root of the area are exactly the zone matrix. Okay, so they proved one direction of this character. The question is, well, maybe the opposite direction is true. I don't know. Of course, because of the discussion of the the, the double equilateral triangle, right? So we need to be very careful when posing this question, right? Because this guy that attains the conjecture of maximum and it's, it's not smooth, right? So the question is, is among smooth local maxima, are the two metrics the only the only one? The only ones. So this is the question. Okay. Okay, so I want you to keep this uh, question in your minds. And now let me introduce um, a different topic. So, because this is exactly, uh, this is where, I mean, uh, I began to think about the problem. Because for other reasons, I started to, to think it would be nice and perhaps interesting to have a theory where we would compare the volume of a three-dimensional Riemannian manifold to the least area of a minimal surface inside this, uh, this guy. And what is the analogy here? Well, geodesics uh, uh, are things that belong to two realms, the realm of dynamics and the realm of geometry. So we can think of geodesics as some orbs of the geodesic flow, but also as critical points of the lens function. So if you want a higher dimension of generalization, the right notion, maybe so you don't have the dynamical interpretation anymore, the right notion is the variational interpretation. So the right object to look at are the critical points of the area function, okay? And so uh, I will now propose a definition and then take some results about um, the comparison between this new notion of system and the volume of a three manifold. Uh, okay, so Simon Smith, first of all, we need a, an existence theorem, right? So we need to know that on every Riemannian three sphere, there is at least an embedded in one three sphere. And this was proven by Simon Smith. Uh, since we have such objects, it makes sense to define the infimum of the area of embedded in one three spheres on any given Riemannian three sphere. And this is a number that I will call, I don't know, the spherical system. Okay, so this is not a standard terminology, but in this talk, maybe we will use this terminology, spherical system. Okay, so I'm looking for the least area of critical points of the area functional in the space of two seats in a given Riemannian three sphere. Okay, so this number also happens to be positive, and well, it's very difficult to compute, right? Because I mean, we need to know at least one two sphere. Seems from the definition, right? We need to know at least one two sphere in order to compute to, to get an estimate from both to, to this number. Uh, so it's very difficult to compute. Uh, but there are situations where this number can be computed. For example, the most symmetric case, the case of the canonical metric. And we can compute it because we know by a theorem of Albany that every minimal two sphere in the canonical three sphere is a great sphere. It's a equator. It's a totally geodesic uh, S2. Okay? And all equators have the same area equal to 4 pi. So this system, this is spherical system of S3 with the canonical metric is 4 pi. Okay? Um, okay, so, uh, well, well the, then the question became, well, is there anything interesting that we can say when you compare this spherical system to the volume of the three sphere? And one of the first things that I did in this regard, so I'm going to talk about now about a work that I done with uh, Rafael Montezuma uh, from the Federal University of Ceará. Uh, so we checked that this number is uh, this comparison, so the system divided by the volume to the right power uh, is plus infinity in the space of all metrics. And actually, even if you restrict yourself to homogeneous metrics with positive sectional curvature, uh, you get this number to be arbitrarily large. Okay? So there is no analogous of the theorem of Kroc. Okay? So Kroc 
right? So you see the complex. So here you can find a sequence of metrics, even homogeneous metrics with positive sectional curvature, all of them with the same volume, and the spherical system can be made as large as you wish. Uh, so we'll not talking much about the proof, but for those who know the Bayesian metrics, so our examples are actually Bayesian metrics. And we could compute the system because there is a classification of mean mode series in such metrics. Okay. Okay, so if the completely general question is hopeless, so there is no uniform upper bound for this uh, number here, uh, the right question is, well, maybe there is some class of metrics such that the restriction of this number to this class still has an upper bound. And by making some analogies with all the problems, uh, we, we thought that the right class would be the conformal class of metrics. So if you pick a metric and look at all the metrics that are function times this metric, so you define the conformal class of this metric, and then you can restrict, try to compute the system normalized by the area in this, within this class of metrics. And also together with Raphael, so we managed to, to prove the following uh, inequality in the conformal class of the canonical metric. So the statement is, if I have a conformally flat metric, so a metric that is conformal to the canonical metric, on S3, and if this metric has positive rich curvature, then uh, the system, the spherical system, is bound from above by square root of 16 over pi times the volume to the power of 2 over 3. And moreover, the equality holds if and only if the metric has constant sectional curvature. Okay, so you can check uh, the seat of the canonical metric is 4 pi, the volume is 2 pi square, so you can do the algebra, you will see that the number is exactly square root, cubic root of 16 over pi. Okay, so our theorem shows that the canonical metric, the metrics with constant sectional curvature, are local maxima inside the conformal class of the canonical metric. Okay? Because there is this neighborhood of positive rich curvature matrix uh, and in this neighborhood uh, you have this inequality. Okay? Uh, so the proof um, I, I will not explain it either but it uses a geometric flow. The, 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 the key idea was to study how the system is varying along this geometric flow called the Yamabe flow, which happens inside conformal classes. So it's a flow, you flow the metric inside the conformal class, trying to minimize the total scalar curvature. And it turns out that this flow is suitable uh, to the study of, of this flow. Okay. Okay, so the result. Um, ah, and by the way, notice that. This theorem is also has a, there is a, also an important contrast between this three-dimensional theorem and the two-dimensional theory, theory, right? Because in two dimensions, as I mentioned, uh, even among convex two spheres, uh, there are metrics that have higher system compared to the area than the canonical metric. While here in three dimensions, the canonical metric is a local maximum. Okay, so this was something unexpected, maybe, but uh, it turns out to be the case. Okay, right, so now let's um, think about what would happen if we try to perturb our conformal class a bit. So we have the conformal class of the round metric, and here we have the graph of our function of S divided by the volume, and by this theorem, at the canonical metric, we see a local maximum that is a strict local maximum, okay? So if you believe continuity in a heuristic sense, if you perturb the conformal class a bit, this profile should repeat itself in the other conformal class. So in this other conformal class, close to the conformal class of the round metric, you should expect, perhaps, also to see another local maximum of this S divided by the volume. 
Okay, so it makes sense, at least from an heuristic point of view, to, to conjecture that there are many local locally local maxima of this uh, functional in, in several conformal classes. So uh, it makes sense also to make the, the, the abstract question. So in other words, uh, are there any necessary conditions that is satisfied by all maximizing methods? And the answer, one, I mean, we, we, we also together with Rafael, we found uh, a, the following criteria. So I will say the most, the simplest version of the theorem. Um, and actually, let me focus on this corollary. So I will read the assumption. So assume I have a metric on a street with positive rich culture. And assume that it's a local maximum of the spherical system normalized by the volume inside its conformal class. Okay. Then, through each point, through each open subset of such S3, passes an embedded minimal two sphere with area equal to the system. Okay, so what is this theorem saying? Is that a necessary condition for a metric to be a local maximum inside its conformal class is the abundance of minimal two spheres with area equal to the system. Okay? So, through each point of this three sphere, there must pass a, a two sphere realizing the system. Okay? So, this is the, the, key, the key observation. Uh, examples, well, we checked that homogeneous metric that naturally satisfy the conclusion of this theorem. Uh, but homogeneous metrics actually satisfy a bit more. So, the, for example, for the VG metrics, uh, uh, you have an explicit description of who are the, the minimal two spheres, and you can check that through each point and through each tangent plane, you can find a minimal two sphere that passes through that point and is tangent to that plane. Okay? So, now let's make a ambitious, uh, ambi not ambitious, but uh, um, a bold move. Okay, so let's make a bold move comparing the situation two dimensions, but zone metrics were special, and these result here uh, with Rafael. So maybe, maybe we should look for an analogous notion of zone metrics in this context of the functional system normalized by the volume. Okay, so maybe liking the initial problem that I mentioned, and this theorem of uh, that zone metrics are local maxima of the system normalized by the area, maybe there is an analogous theorem here in this theory. Okay, so but before proving this theorem, we need the, to define the right analogous of zone metrics in this context. Okay, and also, I mean, it makes sense from a more purely geometric point of view to try to generalize the notion of zone metrics in higher dimensions. So the question, I think the analogous question would be, are there analogs of zone metrics in the theory of minimum n minus one spheres in Riemann and spheres, analogs of zone metrics that are as interesting as zone metrics of two spheres? So these are the two uh, motivating questions uh, uh, to this second half of the, of the talk. Okay, so maybe I will drink a bit of water and allow you time to ask questions. Um, Lucas, could you go back to your um, previous slide, please? Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to understand this theorem uh, that if you have a local maximum of uh, a system uh, uh, in volume one, let's say, Mm -hmm. And there exists a sequence sigma i of embedded index one minimal two spheres with area, well, with the same area as the, the right. local maximum, mm -hmm. with the property that if you integrate on S3 any function, mm -hmm. this is the same as integrating on, uh, of averaging the integral over the spheres, is that? Yes, like a, a Godic theorem. To compute the average of a function on S3, you compute the average of this function of uh, okay. any element of this sequence. Then you compute the average of the first k averages, <laughs> and then you take the limit. 
I see. Uh, and so, so it, this is the integral of a sigma is a two-dimensional integral, right? It is a two-dimensional integral. Yes, it's v. Yes, it, it's uh, uh, maybe I should have denoted d a, but narrow uh, it. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. And, and so the corollary the, is, of course, because if this wasn't true, then you would find an open subset without any, and then you could find the function which is, say, one on this neighborhood and zero yeah. otherwise. And exactly, exactly. I get it. Thank you. Exactly. So, yeah, this is the full statement. Uh, the most precise uh, notion of abundance of minimal guys that we can uh, write down, but this corollary is already interesting right so very long trivial so for example the ellipsoids are certainly not maximizing metrics because in ellipsoids uh they all well in some ellipsoids the only minimal two spheres right are the uh the ones that you get by intersecting the ellipsoid with the the coordinate planes right so there are too too few minimal two spheres in such metrics for them to be maximizing metrics oh yeah uh, okay so this is the moral of the story. If you have a maximizing metric, you should see lots and lots of, of minimal two spheres going everywhere on the on the on the object. Name. Thank you. Okay, so let's now move on to to a proposal of what could be uh, this generalization of the notion of zone metrics in the theory of minimal surface. So since we lose the the dynamical uh, systems perspective, uh, I think it's worth uh, to separate, uh, think about the topology and then think about the geometry. So let me talk first about the topology. Uh, so let uh, SN will denote the standard sphere of radius one in Euclidean space. And let me denote by GR n minus 1 SN in the Grassmannian of n minus 1 planes on SN. Okay, so this is the set of pairs, points in SN, and hyperplanes on the tangent space of the sphere at that point. Okay, so now uh, let's consider a family of smoothly embedded n minus 1 dimensional spheres in SN a family that is smoothly parameterized uh, by point sigma in the real projective plane of dimension n. And why do I take this uh, restriction? Because the set of equators in SN, the set of great uh, hyperspheres, is parameterized by RPN, by the set of lines, each, each line going to the origin, defines an equator by taking the intersection of the sphere with the orthogonal complement of this line. Okay? So this is the set that parameterizes the set of equators in our model geometry. So this is why I want to impose this. And then finally, let me make two extra assumptions. So the first assumption is that to each point in the Grassmannian, namely to each P in SN, to each pi hyperplane of TPN, TPSN, there exists a unique uh, parameter sigma such that the corresponding surface sigma sigma contains the given point p and is tangent to the given plane pi at that point p. Okay? And the other assumption is that this assignment is smooth. So as I vary p and pi, those sigma sigmas are very smoothly as graphs, okay? So these are the two assumptions. And notice how, how, how this is related to the two-dimensional situation, right? So in the, the two-dimensional situation, uh, if we give a point in the direction, we find the geodesic that goes to that point and is tangent to that direction. In the case of a zone metric, uh, Every geodesic is closed and have the same period. So, uh, and they are all circles. So, uh, this form a family with the properties that uh, satisfy assumption one and certainly assumption two as well. 
Okay. Okay, so now let's bring in the geometry. So let's assume now that we have some tone family in the n dimensional sphere, satisfying those assumptions of the previous slide. Uh, then, given a Riemannian metric on SN, I can define a map that I will call generalized mean curvature vector, which does the following. So it picks a point and a plane pi, the Grassmannian. And then computes the mean curvature vector of the only sigma sigma that goes to that point tangent to pi, and computes the mean curvature vector of that with respect to the metric G at that point. Okay, so I have P pi, I find my sigma sigma passing through P with tangent plane pi, and then I compute the mean curvature vector with respect to the metric G of this sigma sigma at the given point P. And why this map is interesting? Because uh, it's well known that the condition of being a critical point of the error, namely of being a minimum object, is equivalent to the vanishing of the mean curvature vector. Okay? So the, the, what we are then looking for is the solution of this equation. Okay? So we want to find a metric G and a so family sigma sigma such that the mean curvature of all those sigma sigma with respect to the g is identically zero. Okay, so in other words, we want to investigate so families of minimum and maximum spheres inside Riemannian and dimensional spheres in a systematic way. It is was uh, this became a joint project with Fernando Max and Andre Neves, so Fernando Podar and Andre Neves. And I will now uh, mention and discuss a few of the results that we obtained. Okay. Okay. So the, is the definition clear? So as you can easily check, in all dimensions we have examples of those objects. We have the canonical metric on SN together with the set of equations. Okay, so but before I introduce, uh, I explain what we did together. So let me let me well briefly say a few things about what people knew already about uh, such objects. Okay, because I mean I I I haven't I have not found any paper where this problem was sort of investigated systematically systematically. So this name so very I mean, I'm, I, 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 we gave this name, but I'm not sure if this is a good name. But anyway, so uh, but even though people have not uh, studied them systematically, people knew objects that had this property. So in two dimensions, of course, people knew Zoe metrics. But in three dimensions, uh, all homogeneous metrics on the three sphere admit so families of embedded minimal two spheres. And this is something that you can read from the classification of minimal two spheres in homogeneous three spheres. Okay, this investigation was done by Mix, Miller, Perez, and Ross. And if you read this paper, you realize that, well, the set of minimal two spheres uh, is parametrized by RP3 and satisfies assumption of one and two that I get. Okay, so. Uh, this is uh, so homogeneous metrics on S3, on S3 are examples of the objects that we are proposing to study. Okay. Uh, okay, so now people also observed, actually, Tohau observed that if you write down the Bayesian metric in the canonical way on S3, so just to form the length of the hot fibers, uh, the metric, the minimal surface for this metric are exactly the equators. Okay, so uh, and this also makes interest in the distinction that I made, so between topology and geometry. So here we see an example of the same so family of series being minimal for different metrics. Okay. So equators are minimal for the canonical metric, 
but they are also minimal for BG matrix, okay? And this was uh, instrumental for us in that uh, computation of the system of the BG matrix, okay? So we have, we know the, who they are, so we can compute the area very easily with that explicit formula. So we can compute the S divided by that volume very easily. Uh, okay, uh, and also, yeah, there is this result of Gauss and Mira. Let me not make some, yeah, but I, 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 maybe I will go back to this later, but uh, um, yeah, so, okay, so uh, let me mention now because maybe it's more convenient. So Gauss and Mira, so they proved, uh, a result of a uniqueness result for minimum spheres in certain Riemannian three spheres, whose assumption was the existence of a Zoll family. Okay, as I said, they didn't call it a Zoll family, but their, their assumption is the existence of a Zoll family of minimum spheres. And when they proved their result, the only examples of Riemannian three spheres with Zoll families of minimum spheres that they knew of were exactly the homogeneous matrix. Right, so uh, there was a question, right? So maybe the result was just a, a different proof of a result that was already known, which is a, was already very interesting because the technique they use is very beautiful. Uh, however, there was this question. So maybe are they talking about only about homogeneous matrix or are they talking about more matrix than homogeneous matrix? Okay, so this was uh, a certain question that appeared from the result. Anyway, so now, uh, let me, me tell you uh, what I did with Andre and, and, and Fernando. So basically, we tried to find new examples of the methods in all dimensions. And there were two strategies that looked reasonable for us from the beginning. So the first strategy would be to start from a zone metric that we know of, namely the pair canonical metric with family of equators and perturb it into a new solution, G, and maybe a new family, sigma, prime sigma, okay? And we were confident that this strategy could work because in two dimensions, uh, there was a precedent. So, Greenham and theorem about two metrics on S2 do exactly this kind of, of perturbation, okay? Uh, but there are, there is also another strategy, and this was a strategy suggested by this observation here about the Bergen matrix. So maybe uh, it would be nice to have a classification of all Riemannian matrix G such that the equators are the minimum two spheres for this metric G. Okay, so we fix this kind of inverse problem. We fix the family, the sole family of hyper spheres and we want to find the matrix that make that all minimal hyperspheres. And, uh, okay, so to have observed the BG matrix as solution, non trivial solution of these in S3. And much before in the 1800s, Beltram proved that, uh, however, in two dimensions, the only example is the canonical matrix. Okay, so, Anyway, either if we, we found more metrics or if we classify more metrics, uh, the result would be nice, I think. So I, uh, we thought that this direction too was also very promising. Uh, anyway, so now I have, I think, maybe 10 minutes or five minutes. So I will make a choice. I will make a choice to discuss a bit more one of these two problems. And I think I will choose the second problem. Um, so let me talk a bit about um, uh, what what we did about this second problem here. Okay. Um, okay. So let me state a few of our results about solutions of this equation. So the first thing is that uh, we can establish a bijection respecting certain natural group actions um, 
between the set of G's such that all the equators are minimal with the set of positive definite, positive definite kinetic symmetric two tensors on the canonical sphere. Okay, so a symmetric uh, two tensor is called kinetic if um, so it's a symmetric two tensor, so let's call it K. Uh, so it's kinetic when when I compute the derivative, the covariant derivative of K in three equal vectors, so D, K, X, 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 so these give me zero. Okay, so this is the killing condition. In other words, if I compute um, K along a geodesic, the derivative of K of gamma prime gamma prime is going to be zero, equal to zero. Okay, so uh, the symmetric killing two tensors are kind of polynomials that are invalid by the geodesic flow. Anyway, so this set of, okay, this looks complicated. However, people knew long before how to classify killing symmetric two tensors. In particular, killing symmetric two tensors, they form a finite dimensional vector space. Okay. Uh, the dimension is easy to compute. For example, when n equals 3, the dimension of this space is 20. Um, and, and so this bijection is telling us that, okay, so the set of solutions is an open subset of a finite dimensional space whose elements we can describe explicitly, okay? So, um, yeah, so I have to mention key prior contributions by especially Theodore Hunger, who studied Riemannian metrics on our end with minimal hyperplex. Uh, okay, so looking from the classification of kinetic symmetric two tensors, it's easy to check that the antipodal map is always, uh, uh, so the action, so the pullback of a kinetic symmetric two tensor by the antipodal map gives the same kinetic tensor. So A star of K equals K. And since the, the, the bijection is equivalent, this means that the antipodal map will also fix the metric. So in other words, uh, the antipodal map is always an isometry of such metric that makes the equator mean. Uh, so if you, you can think of, okay, so those metrics go down to the RPM, right? As metrics where the RPM minus one are also mean. So this is interesting. Another interesting thing is that if you regard S3 as the lead group of unit quaternions, then the left invariant matrix are solutions. Okay, so in this is generalizing the observation of Kohalbo about PG matrix. So actually, if you write down S3, a homogeneous S3 as a lead group with a left invariant matrix, then the equators are minimal. So this is a bit, was a bit surprising. Okay. So because in the description of rows means there is a mirror was not explicit. So now we have explicit description. So we know exactly the sets that are the minimal equations. Uh, uh, so okay, so this is about homogeneous examples, but we found also 3D examples with discrete isometric group arbitrarily close to the canonical metric. In other words, this condition of all equators being minimal do not impose any restriction basically on the isometric group. You can have highly asymmetric uh, geometries, where still they have this amazing property that all equators are mean. Okay, okay so this is um, some results, and from this we extract two simple common corollaries. For example, uh, green uh, show that antipodally invariant zone matrix on the two dimensions here must have constant Gaussian curve. While by this classification here of solutions of this equation, we managed to exhibit examples of antipodally invariant matrix on Sn for every n greater than t3 that contain a sole family of minimal hyperspheres, and however they do not have constant section of curve. Okay, so this old theorem by Green classifying some matrix on Rp2 if you want does not have a high, uh, higher dimensional generalization in this context that I'm discussing of minimal hybrid speeds. And another question that we could answer was a question by Al, uh, who asked if smooth families of minimal surface 
could exist in humanity neighborhood with positive rich culture. And whose isolated group was moreover discrete. Uh, and okay, so we exhibit actually humanity spheres with positive rich culture and discrete isolated group that contain three different of embedded minimum two seeds. Okay. So so this uh, just to show you two geometric consequences, I think uh, yeah, two geometric consequences of this classification, of this investigation, this systematic investigation of question two, which uh, led up to answering two two I think interesting questions. Okay, so time is also almost up, so I will jump now to uh, the end of the talk. Uh, so let me see how do I get to the end of the talk. So maybe I'll have to skip. Yeah, so I think I'll have to skip like this. Uh, I can go back here if you want to ask a question. But just, just to finish, just to look back and then look ahead. So this investigation of two so families of minimal two spheres in remaining three spheres uh, let me realize that my initial hope was uh, hopeless. <laughs> so, because remember, I thought, well, maybe there is this analogy of the abundant result saying that those two dimensional, or those two families of minimal two spheres and remaining three spheres would give metrics that are local maxima of the season of Malachi by the point. But because of the example, I constructed with Andrea and Fernando, I know now this to be false. Okay. Even inside a conformal class. However, I still think that those so metrics, because they have so many minimal two spheres passing through every point and every direction, I still think that they are good candidates to be maximizing metrics. Okay, so I think they are still relevant to this historic problem. Uh, and well, from from other side. Uh, they are also so abundant and curious of metric objects that I think they deserve to be investigated. Well. Okay, so I think this is it. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. So thank you very much for this nice talk. And I would like to invite uh, people from the audience in asking questions. So I'm pretty sure that Lucas will be very happy to answer. Anybody would like to? Anybody wants to add something? Comments? Um, then uh, let me ask you, Lucas, uh, uh, mm -hmm. something. Um, so uh, you have a slide when you, where you say that the um, uh, you studied equation uh, h uh, h equals zero, right, as a function on the space of matrix. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, so this is defined only for uh, metrics uh, that belong to the class of uh, um, admitting uh, this uh, family sigma, uh, sigma, capital sigma with index sigma, right? So, uh, well, exactly. So I mean, but notice that this, the family of surface exists or not of this family of surface is a topological condition. So but only uh, so you, you have to think of this as an equation in two manifold, say a sphere, a three sphere, mm -hmm. and then uh, you would have an equation defined uh, for all metrics. Yes, yes, sphere. Yes, okay. Yes. Uh, is this map smooth? Uh, the, does this map depend smoothly on the metric? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Uh -huh. It does. Uh, can you use something like uh, implicit function theorem or something like that for the? For uh, like when you have a solution of this equation to study, mm -hmm. uh, ca can you compute the derivative of this map uh, with respect to the metric or something like that? We can actually. So this was the other part of the uh, okay the equation, this perturbation technique. 
right? So, and exactly what we did was to study the linearization of the problem. Right. This seems to be a normal. Uh, the, the, the most, right, the standard natural. approach and analysis, right? So, uh -huh. a nearby solution by the increased function theorem. I see. Uh, so, and this is what, what, what we tried to do, but uh, it was a complicated version of the increased function theorem. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. Because we, there seem to be some laws of derivative. The mappings, the derivative in the, in the second variable, the variable of the two family, yeah. is more a normal operator, like an elliptic operator, but the derivative in the direction of the metric is an integral operator, is a Hadron-like transform. And so one goes down, you lose derivative, but the Hadron transform gains derivative. So you have a lot of derivatives. And so we, we, yeah, so we relied on the, the machinery of Hamilton for the increased function theorem in pressure spaces. Ah, I see, I see. Uh, so you have this, um, how do you call it? Um, the Nash Moser. Oh, uh, yeah, Nash Moser. Inverse function thing. I see. So, uh, I can you... just, so, so just for you to have a flavor of what has the, the tangent direction, right? So the parametrizing space of the solution. If you try to do, ah, sorry. If you try to do the deformation inside the conformal class, uh, you should look at directions that are given by odd functions. Uh -huh. So if you take any odd function, you can produce a variation inside the conformal class, tangent to this odd function, that's the canonical method. Uh, deformation by so by so uh, matrix by solutions of HG. I see. So equals it. Oh, that's interesting. Odd functions. Okay. Odd functions. Odd functions. Thank you. Um, yeah, functions that do not go down through RP RPM. <laughs> right, right. Like in Brinks and results. That's very interesting. So, looking forward to seeing. Uh, uh, do you have any article already uh, pub uh, or published or um, just um, on archive? Uh, archive. Yeah. So last uh, December we put the paper on archive. I see. So I think the title is not very different from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I will find it. Yes. These three. Names. I, it's my last paper on the archive. So. Very good. I think the title is different. Excellent. Sounds very interesting. Thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to ask a question to Lucas? Yeah, no. I do have a simple question. Sure. Uh, in in the case of zone metrics in the two sphere, mm -hmm. uh, the condition that all the geodesics have the same length is automatic, or is it is uh, mm -hmm. or is it condition <laughs> in the definition of zone metric? Uh, no, but it should, no, it's not a, uh, it, it does not, it does not follow from the definition that I gave that all geodecks are periodic and have the same fundamental, ah, no, uh, uh, let me think that this is a bit. What I want to answer, so. Okay, so. I impose the condition that that assignment P pi to C, the corresponding surface was smooth, right? Yes. yes. Uh, by this I mean I have a, an embedded sigma sigma and the nearby sigma sigma prime are all graphical over the sigma sigma, sure. a graph of a function that depends smoothly on sigma prime. Yes. So, the nearby um, surfaces, right? So they have area varying continuously with the parameter. And since oh, these surfaces are the critical point yeah. of the area functional, they all have the same area. Sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. So okay. it's a consequence of. Uh, Is that consequence? Exactly. But the, of, yeah, because, the assumptions one and two. 
the consequence of assumption one and two plus minimality. Plus minimality of the surface. Perfect. Plus, plus minimality of the surface. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any because other minimality is critical point, and in a continuous family of critical points, they all have the same value of the function. Right, right, right. Any other um, question for Lucas? Don't be shy. Well, if this is not the case, I would like uh, to thank the speaker. Let me clap uh, uh, on behalf of the whole audience.